Well, welcome to a very special See Here Love podcast for International Women's Day 2023. And what better way to celebrate than to hang out with three Canadian women who are leading, mentoring, influencing, inspiring, speaking, creating, teaching, preaching, advocating, and making a difference in this country. Really, let's just be honest. I wanted us to spend the day with great women, to be encouraged, to support them, to gush about them and to celebrate what God is doing in and through our lives. So welcome, Kathy Osicha, Shar Queering, and Cheryl Weber to See Her Love on this really special day. Great to be with you, Mel. Yeah, so, so good to be So great you. to advocate for women. Yeah, I love this. And you know, I, I don't want to go too long on your bios because I could be, we could be for here for hours saying all the incredible things you do. But for those who don't know our special guests, Cheryl Weber, speaker, TV host, journalist, social advocate, and now director, right, Cheryl, of Crossroads Cares, a faith-based humanitarian and relief and development organization. So welcome, Cheryl. I know speaking to thousands and thousands of people on national television and as you speak on platform, uh, just your influence in the space of social justice and advocacy. Incredible. Great to be here. Thanks, Mel. And Shar, Shar Queering, Shar is the founder and now co-leader of the Sisterhood YXE movement in Saskatoon. And Shar is passionate about engaging, encouraging, and mobilizing the next generation of young women. Shar, welcome. It's good to have you here. Oh, thanks for inviting me. And Kathy Osipchuk. Kathy, known as a leadership catalyst, communicator, consultant, and coach, author, and podcast host. And Kathy is the co-founder and lead catalyst of Gather a transformational movement that connects women, equip, equips leaders, and mobilizes the female church in Canada. And you've also published a book called Brave Women, Bold Moves, Choosing Courage in a Culture of Conformity. Welcome, Kathy. Always a privilege. This is really great. Well, you know, I just wanted to start off really quickly. And some of us are just getting to know each other, so this is going to be interesting. And some of us know, have known each other for a long while. But why don't we do kind of a roundtable? I love doing this with my girlfriends. And just 15 seconds, just sort of gush or encourage each other um, about what we're doing, about who they are. So, like, we'll go around. We'll start with, like, Kathy, why we love Kathy, why we love Char, why we love Cheryl. <laughs> I know. I've thrown it out to you. It's like, are you serious, Melinda? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then we can just do that. Because I really want to really, I think, sort of demonstrate what women need to do more of that we need to actually mm. encourage and gush about one another and, and really show that. So why not do it here on International Women's Day? Mm. So let's start with Kathy. Let's all gush about Kathy right now. <laughs> so get ready. And again, really Hi. short, you guys, 15, 20 seconds, why we love Kathy. Shari, you want to start? Yeah, I do. I think Kathy's brave. I think that that's the word that comes to mind. And I know that's a part of your book. And I just think that you've stepped into the gap a few years ago, Kathy, and you've just started to chart territory across Canada where there there weren't these women um, leaders and, and women groups starting up. And you just, you just took, yeah, the plow and started going. I love it. So I think that, yeah, I just am so impressed with that. Ooh, all right. That's awesome. Cheryl to Kathy. Yes. I'm going to say um, great humility because, you know, when you have been kind of a, a gender or oppressed at any kind of suffered any kind of discrimination, um, you you know, people kind of like you have this, like you're trying to get somewhere for yourself. And it takes a lot of humility to say this is, I'm not going to make this about me or me having my mm -hmm. platform, but I'm going to, open a platform and cheer on other women. And I've seen Kathy have this national vision, cheer on women across Canada and open doors for them. And I just think it's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I would agree with both of you. I think for Kathy, wow, trailblazer, catalyst, always a voice for women and finding women who don't have a voice, who don't have a platform and giving them a platform all across Canada. I think mm -hmm. the work of your mentoring, Kathy, is huge. And you are brave, you are bold, and you are a catalyst. So thank you. Thank you for just the great work you're doing in Canada. Yeah. And I'm blushing. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> hey, that was the whole point. That should make us all feel really uncomfortable as we share. <laughs> 
All right, Char. Okay, Kathy, want to start with Char? I know, Cheryl, you just met, but we'll just gush anyway. So, Kathy, why don't you start? And we're going to now gush about Char. Oh, yeah, Char. Char, you're such an amazing visionary, and that is mixed with such compassion. And I know you've just come off a, kind of a, a mind-blowing encounter with the Holy Spirit as you gathered women in Saskatoon for in this place. So you just see into spaces that I can't see and you gather women as well. And I know you have a national a call on your life as well. So I just think that um, you're amazing. I can't wait to see what God continues to do in you and through you. Thank you. Amazing. Now, Cheryl, I know you've just met Sharia right now. Yeah, I'm super <laughs> so insightful though. So I'm, I don't know if this is, this is what I got from just a few minutes we've, we've chatted here and met, but I see in you a real kindness, mm -hmm. um, a gentleness. Um, and I think it's amazing. It is tough to get people out to events these days, especially after COVID. You know, everybody, we just got used to meeting like this and we have to get our makeup done and leave the house. So I think for you to pioneer something like that, an event driven thing, I know that you must be um, strong and determined and um, a great networker of people. How about you guys? Nice. Wow. In the, in the two minutes you've met. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's great. And I would say, again, the same things that Kathy and Cheryl have said. There's always been a gentleness and kindness about you in, in the interactions we've had, an openness and a really open arms to all women and people that you serve. I love your heart for mentoring the next generation, like mentees and really being um, diligent, thoughtful and deep in that space, which is what we desperately need. And and just your commitment in building a community um, out where you are in Saskatoon uh, to inspire and encourage women in their faith. And so, um, yeah, I love what you're doing and so grateful that you're here and the work that you're doing in Canada, so. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that. Just, that's a great way to start a Monday morning, just with a little encouragement, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Now on to Cheryl Weber. Kathy, you want to start with Cheryl? Oh, wow. Uh, Cheryl, you carry the hearts of the impoverished, um, the underrepresented, you know, kind of the needs of the world, and you bring them into um, a space where they can be illuminated. So through your platform as you host and as you bring the stories my world is expanded and i love that it comes from such a place of passion and you're also very very humble but you are quite magnificent so i love and appreciate you cheryl thanks Kat. amazing and Shaw, you've just met cheryl so <laughs> yeah no um i i have met cheryl but i've heard about cheryl before and i've i've watched cheryl before and i i would say the same things kathy and i would also just add that uh yeah, also a kindness. And, and as we talk about um, this topic today, I would say that, that you're creating that space, that equity for women. And so, yeah, I just, um, I'm excited to see what the Lord's going to do in, in and through the work that you're doing. And I, I just think that, um, yeah, I, someone to watch. And it's, it's exciting. So. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Cher, we've had many years on different shows. Uh, watching our careers you know grow and it's been so amazing to see you grow in leadership in communication and advocacy um i think the thing that really inspires me so much about you is just your adventurous heart and curiosity for the world and for others that's what makes you a great journalist but that also makes you a great advocate it also makes you the perfect position to lead a you know a relief and humanitarian you know uh organization and it's, I think, the Holy Spirit in you of being curious, asking the right questions, and serving and making the world aware of the needs of people. And that's a very mm. unique, special gifting not a lot of people have. And so I'm so grateful for you. I'm grateful for our friendship. And I'm really excited to see what God is going to do in the next years um, as you continue to share about the needs of the marginalized and what Kathy said, like the impoverished, uh, those that are hurting, and, and help to get us you know, as women and, and people of Canada uh, mobilized to, to serve and be aware of the needs. So really grateful for you. Thank you. That was really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I 
celebrated first thing as we celebrate International Women's Day. No, <laughs> what is it? We need to kind of demonstrate this and do this more uh, face to face with our women mm -hmm. and the women that we, um, you know, that we kind of go arm in arm with. So very, very grateful for all of you. Are so, we are we going to Melinda? Are we yes. talking about Melinda? Well, just like because I yeah I can start. Okay, I, I just think that we get to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I just see you've created such a platform and you're championing women across our nation too. And I just I love that and I love the warmth that you you bring. And um, yeah, I think that there's just so many women have been encouraged and and also just grown because of what what you're doing. So thank you, Melinda. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to pop in there. It's really about the long game. And uh, you started a few years ago, we were starting kind of pioneering, looking at the landscape and seeing what's needed. And you saw into the future, mm -hmm. you know, starting on the web, expanding into so many areas. And I think you're always reinventing, but not reinventing because you're at a loss, but I think reinventing because you know, with clarity what the next thing is and you're in the game like you're staying so you're going long and you're going deep and you're going wide and that's what i admire about you as a female leader you're very inspiring yeah. thanks and i would say oh there's so many things to say about you melinda i mean obviously the way you're giving platform to so many just like kathy women who we didn't know about who are doing amazing things across this country is again another sign of just preferring others. Um, I think you're creative, you have strong leadership skills, and you are the best networker I've ever met. And not just networking for yourself, but actually like in, uh, including people. Like you're really mm -hmm. intentional about making sure that people who feel like maybe they just moved here and don't know anybody or, you know, introducing people to each other, like you are, you are like the, the top networker I've ever met in my life, honestly, you're amazing. But, but yeah. for a good cause, which I love. Uh, thanks guys. Well, I really appreciate that. That's made. Okay. We're done. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> we've done the show. We did, we did what I really wanted to really happen. It's just encouragement and then we're done, but no, thank you. And I'm, and, and I really wanted us to just take that moment on this international women's day to really just share uh, with one another. I think it's important and I hope it encourages you to continue doing that. And also our, our viewers and listeners to maybe, take this moment and say, you know what, I'm going to just call up my girlfriend or uh, take out a girlfriend today and just tell her how much she means to me and how she inspires me and encourages me. And I think we just need to do that more. So thank you for uh, doing that. So I wanted to gather you together just to talk about for International Women's Day, the theme is embracing equity. And it's, and it's really about encouraging, um, you know, one another, women, in equal and equitable opportunities um, where we are at in our workplaces and for us in ministry um, in leadership. And so I've got a couple questions for you and I'm, I'm so excited to hear your thoughts because I think this will really encourage you know others, but even for myself as I lead. But I wanna start off with this report from Lean In and McKinsey and Co. Uh, it was a 2022 workplace report. And it says, women in leadership are leaving their jobs at the highest rate ever seen. And the reasons are due to employers not meeting the expectations of women leaders. And these expectations include a workplace focus on flexibility, employee well-being, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. What are your thoughts on this report? Agree? Disagree? What's happening there? Kath, let's start okay, with you. I, Wait. Yeah. Oh, no, Cheryl. Okay, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I found that shocking because... Knowing, I guess, you know, I've been in this um, ministry space for decades and knowing where, how it used to be and how it is, uh, we still have a long way to go, but it's so much better than it was. So I'm, I'm so surprised to see that. I mean, I do understand um, the diversity and inclusion piece. A lot of my friends um, from minority communities feel so not heard or just heard, but no action taken. That's mm -hmm. kind of what I've seen. Like maybe there's a new attitude of like, well, let's form a committee or listen to you, but no action. So I can see it from that. But I also recently read a study. This was just in 2021 in Canada. Women make 89 cents for every dollar that men make. I can't help but wonder if that's not part of it. I mean, here we are in 2023 
and women still do not get equal pay to men. Like that just blew my mind. I'm like, how is it? And I, and I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's on purpose. I think those are hidden attitudes and biases that people don't realize they have where they value a women's contribution as less than a man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good thoughts. Kathy, what about you for this, for this report? Okay. Well, I am not shocked by that. <laughs> and there's that report. I think that would be maybe marketplace culture, uh, work culture, professional culture. In ministry culture, it's probably a little bit even more shocking because we're a little bit behind what's going on um, out there in the big world where it the when I worked with a leadership development organization, there was some research done that within a year of a woman moving outside of a corporate culture into a ministry culture, her self-esteem plummets by 75%. So there's a lot going on in this world that's a little bit more challenging. And I think it's in part to what you said, um, women have to piece their lives together differently than men. So yeah, we, if we have families, if we have other things that we're juggling plus working, mm -hmm. does working kind of speak to our needs so that we can bring our best each and every day? And I would say that answer is most likely no. And the other challenge is we don't really have the confidence to know how to ask for what we need. And so I think it raises a lot of, um, things that have maybe largely been invisible to visibility to say it's better than it used to be, but is that still as much <laughs> as good as it can be? I think it's what we relate it to. And I agree with Cheryl that there's still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. mm. It's good. Char, your thoughts on the report? Yeah. Well, the first, the first thought, honest thought was, the employers must not be female. And then I was thinking, why aren't there more female employer employers? Because I feel like when there's empathy um, in employers, it's because they've experienced some of the same things. And so maybe that's uh, a root of, of part of the problem is that the employers need to, we need to have more women um, in, in the top seats um, as well. And I think too, there's just, um, there, there is just, there's not the compromise. Uh, women don't want the, to compromise family and uh, sacred space and Sabbath and those kinds of things. And I think they are just taking a stand and saying, I'm not going to work in this place or stay in this space where everything is compromised, where it's out of balance. And I think maybe in the past, um, maybe we didn't feel like we had that that right or um, options and maybe there are more options and maybe women are just saying, I'm not willing to, to just um, put everything in, into one area. So those were my mm -hmm. thoughts, but I, I love what you're, what you're saying too, Kathy and Cheryl. So. Mm -hmm. No, it's good. And I think that leads into this question because I'm always, you know, you're saying it's really great answers, but then how is the church or ministry, how can we better, be better at retaining women leaders. Like, you know, Shara's like, well, maybe there should be more women leaders in that space, but how can we better retain women leaders? And what are we getting wrong when it comes to women leaders? What are we getting right? So I mean, let, let's start with what, how can we better retain women leaders? What is that, what would that look like in church ministry, ministry? Yeah, well, I've been talking to a lot of women leaders, um, especially since I think in two, 2022, I had more one-on-one -on -one conversations than I've had in a lifetime. And just listening to stories, and I think one need that we have specifically as females is the need for this, the need for these conversations, for us to be mentoring each other, uh, calling each other up. If you're in a female in ministry, either in a church or a ministry context, usually, not always, but usually the demographics are that there are more males on staff at a church or more males in ministry that are leading the organization than females. So you come in disproportionately underrepresented anyway. And so how do you find collegiality in that setting? How do you find this in that setting? Well, the research shows, especially the research that we've just started with uh, the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada is that we have to go outside our ministry context to find that. So we have to have our communities outside our workplace, whereas, you know, males generally can have it 
their guys are in the house, right? So they can go off and do stuff together. Also, a lot of women in ministry are single, single women under 40 who are pastoring or taking on leadership roles. And their needs are, they have to fully support their lives. They're the single breadwinner, whereas if it's a, a male on staff, he usually has a wife or other means of income to support the call on his life. So there are a lot of challenges that kind of, again, they stay below the surface because we're not really examining the makeup of ministry teams or church teams to better meet the needs of the women so that they will stay. Ooh, that's good. There's a lot of work to be done, eh? I mean, in being really intentional about these conversations and the needs of women, like the single woman, right? The woman that has incredible giftings uh, that can Bible teach and preach. I mean, we'll get into that, but that's really good points, Kathy. Any response, Cheryl Kshar, to that, like what Kathy's saying? No, I totally agree. I see that even in our own church setting. Um, I, and I do, I, I also want to add that I think that women, even when they're in partnership with, um, with the, the, maybe the lead pastor, they're a married couple, I find that the, even the voice of the woman is um, it, it, it could be as equal or as, as strong. And when I've seen that demonstrated in some church churches and ministries, it's very effective. And I think that just changing the, yeah, just our, our culture around that would be, would be amazing. I think that that's, we're always supposed to do ministry together with, you know, men and women, just we're supposed to model it. I think in the church would be the best place to model it. It's modeled, I think, more in, in secular settings. Um, but I'd love to see that, that being a stronger thing that's modeled, right? Yeah. I think too, um, including men in this conversation would be so important because I think so many of them are unaware of what it feels like to walk into a room of all men and take your place at the table and have an equal voice. And they all go hang out afterwards or watch sports, go watch the Super Bowl together, whatever, you know, like, and I, I have to give a um, kudos to Kathy right now in this moment, because when she had a gather out in Alberta, she had a gathering of women and invited just a number of men to show up just a small number. And so there's only two men that, that said yes to that invitation. And they, for the first time, maybe even experience what it's like to be in a room of leaders and be the minority. Mm -hmm. And I think that was probably really educational to them. I remember what it was like for me as a white person to walk into a room and be the only white person in a room. And for the first time, think about the color of my skin, which I'd never thought about before. And, and that what that experience was like for other people who are underrepresented. And so, you know, even when we do diversity, equity, and inclusion in our workplaces, they're generally not addressing the, the female, the gender aspect of it. You know, it's really only about racism, but it's not about what it's like to be a woman. And, and actually, and I have to say too, as women leaders, we also need to be advocates. Sometimes women just get there and then that's it. And I, you know, I think back to a number of years ago, having a woman at the top of an organization I was working for and the first kind of breaking that ceiling, the first woman ever, and every executive that she put into place was male. And so I called her on it, you know, just one on one. And I said, it's so great to see you in that position. It means so much to us as women to see that glass ceiling being broken. But where are the other women leaders that you're advocating for? Not over men, but as well as men. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that did change. And to her credit, you know, she did start uh, putting some women into position. But I, I just over the years, I've seen women say get get to a top executive role and say, oh, yeah, I know I'm pro woman, but then they don't really follow up on that. So it's leveraging your voice. And don't get me wrong. I'm pro men and pro women. I don't think we should be in competition. We need just as Char said, we need to work together. The whole world is in despair, is in crisis, and it take, it's going to take the whole church to respond and to be there and to bring hope to the world. Excellent. So what are we getting right? So we've kind of identified, you know, how can we be better retaining? What is getting, what, what's wrong in, in sort of some of the challenges? But right now, what would you say? Are we getting anything right in church, in a ministry where you're leading 
as far as women in leadership, empowering women? What are we getting right? Uh, who's the we in that, I guess, is the question. You know, uh, it's like, when we say church, Kathy, and we say, oh, this, you know, big C church, <laughs> we. No, that's a good, that's a good question. Who, 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 who is we? I think the ones that are getting it right, right. Um, even if it's one church or one ministry getting it right, they would be hiring or investing in, um, not because of gender, but because of gifting. They would be recognizing the gifts um, in within the house or within the ministry and raising that talent up rather than looking at, um, is it a man or a female? They would be looking at the gifting. And I think that that is a large enough category that it does um, include not only gender diversity, but also cultural diversity, like who is gifted for that moment and investing in that talent. And I think the, the ones that get that right have more opportunity because uh, young leaders, emerging leaders, young women, young men, they want to be part of that kind of environment when they, where they know that they're going to be seen for what they're carrying, but God has seated in them. Um, <laughs> that will keep them from having to compete or having to prove themselves. And I think the challenge is when women find themselves in environments where they have to continually prove themselves or outprove themselves in relationship to the men, you know, just like I've got to prove it. I got to, they traditionally, and I can say this because I've been working with a lot of female staff on churches. They work three times as hard and they put in multiple more hours than the men because their gifts are maybe not the things that are in, invested in and, they have to give more and it drains them more. So I would say, let's get it right. And those that are getting in right are investing in calling people up because of gifting and not based on gender. Yeah, I would agree. I think that um, in the past, it's been the children's pastor and um Maybe another role that uh, the women have been been seen as as uh, this is your space, and I think showing um, you know giving giving platform, giving space uh, for the giftedness and and um, and and demonstrating that. Like in our in our church, we are seeing that we're seeing more um, on platform. We're seeing more at the board level. We're seeing women occupy those spaces and I think that's just it's a beginning and I think that um yeah just to to keep opening those up and and then as women um not to feel like we don't belong there either so I think it's a two-way you know we've been told we don't belong so then we can step in and feel like we don't belong but we need to we need to embrace that too and step up and um have that confidence, that God confidence, that God is gifting us in that area and giving us that platform so or that space. It doesn't have to be a platform. It can be wherever God is leading us as leaders. So, yeah. Sure, I was just laughing because it was like um, coffee manager, kids <laughs> ministry, hospitality <laughs> desk. And listen, I'm not trying to say those aren't no. just to serve. What I'm saying is yeah. even when I was growing up, those were the roles. Like I well, and say. wasn't it called sharing instead of a uh, sermon? You know, right. it's, it's yeah. sharing and, um, yeah, even, the, even our language, even our language yeah. around it. Right? Absolutely. So, 10% language. Yeah. I think having these conversations, seeing them happen more and more, uh, gives me a lot of hope. Seeing women take on roles outside of the traditional roles or executive level roles, I think is, is really inspiring and important. I think seeing single women be pastors, that really kind of like blew my mind, which is crazy, I know. But when I was younger, even trying to get involved in youth ministry at my local church, they were I was not allowed to lead a cell group. It was only married people. Mm -hmm. So I was like this youth leader that did nothing because I wasn't married. You know, it was the qualification I needed. And so thankfully, I have not experienced a lot of that single person discrimination. And I'm so thankful but I think a lot of women do. And so when I see like, oh, you put a, like a senior pastor as a woman and she's single, it's like totally shocking to me, but it's so encouraging. And so 
I think even as we look at the work to be done, we have to give credit to the churches that are doing the work, the ministry mm-hmm. organizations and making space for women and for the women who are stepping up because, it's, you know, you can be invited into a space, but if you don't say yes and fill it, that's mm-hmm. a whole other thing. And so women who are stepping up to, I just want to cheer them on right now and say, you yeah. know, it's not easy when you're a pioneer or the first person or a rarity. Um, thankfully it's becoming less rare, but like the courage that that takes, like, Full, full honors to those women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's really good. So why are you leading? (laughs) I mean, there's been some obviously challenges. There has been obstacles. There have been detours. Uh, So I think, you know, for a lot of women and men listening, they're like, okay, but why are you leading at this stage and age? And your biggest challenge and biggest win I love hearing these kinds of stories. Is it worth it? Has it been worth it leading in your space? Why do you do it? Charlotte, start with you. Why are you leading? What has been your biggest challenge? Biggest yeah. Win, biggest you know, um, yeah, I think that leading, I, I keep leading because I feel called. I think if I didn't feel that calling, um, it would be so easy so many times to just quit because there's so many things that come up against us. And um, I just, yeah, I just feel like answering to God someday will be my biggest, uh, is the most important thing. So not trying to silence the voices of those around me and even sometimes my own voice. And you will, um, you asked what is was challenge. And I think that, that is a challenge sometimes to not feel, um, yeah, not feel like I'm the person to be in the position or not feel that I'm equipped enough or that I have enough. And I think that those voices are, are sometimes, yeah, the things that I, that I fight back against. It's not, it's not some God's voice. If he's calling me, he's going to equip and, uh, position me well with, with, leaders around me to help carry the vision and that's exactly what he's doing so I think those are the two things that are the hard things and then that's the the thing that is the win is that he's brought such amazing um, gifted women alongside to carry the vision that he's given us and so yeah it it is a joy Um, it's a struggle a lot of times and it's such a joy it's such a fulfilling um, amazing thing like even just our our event on Saturday to see the Holy Spirit in the room, to see so many younger women coming to the altar to get, yeah, to be free, to have, have um, just new purpose to, to make decisions. It was, it was honestly such a high and it, it just makes you keep going because the Lord is in it and he's directing it. So, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, Shar, do you have a really good community around you to support you? Yes, I absolutely do. Because I think that's one of the biggest things I hear a lot is a lot of women don't have, and we'll talk about that a little bit mm-hmm. later, about a community to support in the work and yeah. through the challenges. Um, but that's really good to know that you've got people who are for you, yeah. have your back and support you. Yeah. Right. Kathy, why are you leading? Biggest challenge, biggest win so far. Yes. I'm surprised you didn't say at your age, why are you still leading? That's what I asked myself. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think I agree with the brilliant and stunning Char. Uh, it's, it's just really obedience. Uh, every day I wake up and think, can I just go be a Starbucks um, barista today? And <laughs> That'd be my ideal life. Drink lots of coffee and you know, serve in that way, but it, cause it, it's a weight. It's, it's a very heavy weight. It just doesn't leave your shoulders. You wake up with it. You, you go to bed with it, but underneath that, if you're resourced, like to Char's point, um, you can be thriving if you have, you know, sufficient community and, and, you know, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically you're doing, you have the habits and the disciplines that will resource, you know, that call, um, it can be done. And I don't want to be the one that quits. Very simply, I don't want it to be me. I will not be that person. But every day I think about quitting for sure. Like I just, I don't want to, I don't want to undersell that it's hard. And why is it hard? Well, to Shar's point again, it's usually the voices in my own head. It's usually the narratives that I'm, you know, carrying that put the lid on what I think is possible. 
And the biggest win, so here, here's, here's the joy, is when you see one woman, one woman who comes to the front, you know, we, we just had gathering Calgary. We had the same thing, women coming, pouring to the front saying, my dreams are dead. You know, I'm, th I think I'm done. And they pray and they realize, you know, when they're told you actually can go be a transforming agent in your environment, those external voices, the external opposition to your voice and what you carry does not define you. And when the women kind of owns what they're carrying and saying, yeah, I actually can be the transforming agent. I can transform my environment. If it's one woman that steps into that yes, then anything's possible. And so I want to be the one holding the door open for that person, saying to that woman, you can go transform your environment. Even if it's a, a church, you know, staff team, even if you're in a rural area, that's not, you know, necessarily life giving to you. What could it be because you're in that room? And so I want to keep having that voice. Um, I will keep, you know, doing my roots <laughs> and making sure that, you know, I, I, I'm in the game because, I, yeah, I don't want to be the one that quits, not just for my generation, because my generation is still very vitally important, um, but for the next generations to follow. I will be here for them. So good. It's great, Kathy. Wow. Cheryl. Uh, yeah, you know, I, the reason I'm leading, honestly, is that God dreams bigger dream, dreams for your life than you ever do. And he always speaks to the future you. So you'll be at one season in your life and he'll, he'll be saying, oh, you know, Shar, I see, and Kathy, I see you leading a national women's organization and, or conferences and bringing women together. And you're like, what? Me? Why me? You know, and I, and I would say that's my experience of God in my life. He's always speaking a greater vision over me than I ever really dreamed. And, you know, I have to share the scripture verse pretty early on. Um, when I was in my twenties, he gave me Proverbs eighteen sixteen, and it says, um, a gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. And, and another translation says a, a man's gift makes a place for him and brings him before great men. And I remember God said to me, I wrote the Bible. I have editorial control. So I'm going to tell you a woman's gift will make a place for her and bring her before great people. And he said to me, I don't want you to worry about what people think about your gender, your gifting or your ability, but I want you to trust that I'm going to get you where I want you to go, regardless of what people think. And I didn't realize at the time what a gift that was to me because I've held on to that verse for decades. And I've gone through seasons of people trying to hold me back, trying to put me down, people that don't believe in me. I've certainly faced gender discrimination over the years. But I never got bitter about it because I never focused on the discrimination or the person, but I focused on the call and the promise. And I just said, God, you're going to get me. There doesn't matter what this person is thinking and what this um, season is bringing, the pain that it's bringing to my life. I'm just going to trust you because it's your call and it's your plan and no one can stand on the way of God. And I've seen it, you know, and when you talk about wins, I think my win is that I have outplayed, outlasted, out resilienced all of them all the people, right. And we'll continue to do so. And also forgiven, you know, this week, I'm going to um, have a social event with, with one of those leaders who really uh, made life incredibly painful and hard for me. And I'm going to be kind and, and loving and excited to see that person because I did the hard work of forgiveness. And I'll do it again when I see them, if any of that old stuff comes up. And it's just like, I'm just not going to let that ruin me. I'm just going to hold on to the promises of God and keep showing up and tell fear that you are not going to control my life. And, you know, that that's how you do it. You just keep saying yes when you don't feel worthy. You say yes when you feel afraid. You say yes when people are standing in your way and you just keep going. And somehow God gets you there. That's all I can really say. Um, mm -hmm. The biggest challenge, I would say, is, is yourself as a leader you're fighting your insecurities. You're fighting sometimes those battles of forgiving or the, the discrimination, keeping your attitude right, thinking that you can do it. I mean, honestly, conquering yourself is the hardest part of leadership, I think, especially for a woman. For whatever reason, we're so hard on ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, Cheryl, that's so good. I mean, conquering yourself, absolutely. I would say every woman that I talk to as far as who is in, in leadership positions, that's the biggest thing. Imposter syndrome. Um, I can't do it. Am I worthy? Can I be at the table? I don't know everything. They're going to find me out. The biggest one I hear a lot of times is so, so many women will say, eventually I'm going to be found out. 
that I don't know. <laughs> I don't know everything. It's like, nobody knows everything. Nobody knows everything. You know, like it's, it's wild. And, and for, especially for me, I'm already down the path of all the possibilities. And yet I'm not in the present really faced with reality of really what's going on. And that's one of the biggest things I've had to conquer too, is I think of all the bad scenarios that could happen, which have not happened yet. <laughs> and which sometimes can immobilize me from actually moving forward because I thought of all the, the worst scenarios. Uh, but I agree, those are great. Like, I mean, why am I leading uh, the call? I mean, not, you know, gifting and calling. I think I had great parents who encouraged me from a young age. That's why I always speak to parents about how you can encourage your, your kids, especially your girls in, in roles of leadership and ability. And, and my dad and mom were my biggest supporters as I was, as I was growing up. And, you know, biggest challenge, I think you're right, yourself. And I've had a lot where, you know, uh, I'm a brown woman uh, with a gifting of communication. And in the church, when I was growing up, that wasn't really loved. Uh, and there was a lot of, um, I had to deal with a lot of men who wanted to control and put me down and, and not give me a place or a space to speak because of, because of this. And so that was really hard because then you start resenting yourself. Like, if only I was a man, or if only I wasn't brown, or if only I wasn't so a communicator, and if I wasn't so outspoken. And I, I know that that grieves the Lord. It, it grieves God when we say these things, because this is how he's made us. And here we're like, why? Why am I like this? I don't want to be this way. And so I, uh, that was one of the biggest, you know, challenges. But in the win, I, you know, when women and men have rallied for me and mentored me and given me opportunity. Here I am today. I say that. Why I'm here today is that so many men and women gave me a chance to, to be where I am, to be who I am, and to give me platform and space to, to do what God has called me to do. And that's why I think yeah. why I'm doing what I'm doing is because I've received that from so many other people, giving people a platform, giving people an opportunity to speak and share. And so... I would say that's, you know, the biggest win is, is the people that have supported me over the years. It's big. And I know that for us too. I mean, why is mentoring so important? Each one of us has said that as part of why, what we're doing in our leadership is that we're mentoring, giving space and platform for others. Why at this stage and, and age for us is that so important? The mentoring, the giving platform, amplifying different diverse voices. What would you say? Well, I, when you isolate anybody, but especially when you isolate a woman, uh, bad things happen. <laughs> we're not good on our own because, you know, the, the voices in our head, like what, we're going to take ourselves out. And so we need at least that one other, you know, preferably a happy few <laughs> that come around. And, you know, I've got somebody that raises my arms um, almost every time I need her, I call her and she goes, I'm here to raise your arms. Like I'm following you. I believe in you. And you're right, like we don't have these opportunities to do what we started off this show today doing, which was calling out the greatness in each other. And that's not a bad thing. We tend to, we can't underplay, we can't focus on our weaknesses. We need to focus on our strengths. And, you know, if I didn't have those people around me, both male and female, I would, I would have been out long ago. So, you know, you have to have somebody speaking into your life. You have to have the peer on peer relationships, but you also need to be speaking into. So I, I would say, look at those three, three areas, you know, those three tiers and make sure that in each place, you know, there's representation, but it's so important. Mm -hmm. Sure. I know you're big into mentoring uh, with mm -hmm. sisterhood. Uh, <laughs> why is it that's so important? Why have you created an incredible resource? Um, around it, and that's been yeah. such a focus for you. You know, I think the same things that Kathy's saying is that we need we need women to raise our arms. Um, I think that the younger generation has just been um, bombarded, really, um, in ways that we we don't even understand. And I think that having um, it's very biblical having older women. Or women who've walked ahead on their journey uh, speak into the life of a younger woman and just be there for them, just to listen to be a close, close community to them. Um, it just 
it gives them that support and that strength. Uh, what we've done with with the publication or with the with what we've created is really pick um, some of the top things that women struggle with, and we've identified the mentor and the mentee with those same struggles. But the mentor is way further ahead, and they've been rooted in gospel, and they've been had their arms held up as well. So they're they're now coming alongside a younger woman and just carrying them through. And we've seen beautiful relationships through that and, and carrying well beyond the eight-month um, time that we kind of allot for, for them to be mentors because they're finding that those deep relationships are what they've been longing for. And I think, like you said, Kathy, they've been isolated. And when they're isolated, especially with the, the pandemic and, and just our world in general is more isolating. Um, and so I think you know, having that community and being in with walking with somebody has just been life changing for a lot of women. So yeah, big advocate of, of that. I would say, um, I, I remember being a young, a young, uh, person in ministry looking up to one of the pastors at the church I was working at and just wanting to get to know her and wanting her, wanting to learn from her and she was not interested and and it was really hard for me you know like i just i i want to i i want to learn from your wisdom and i so admired her and one of the things god showed me is that when you're a pioneer you take all the hits to get to where you need to go and then the people that follow have it easy because you've you've cleared the way but you're the one who paid the price and sometimes what can happen when you're the volunteer when you're the pioneer is that you resent the people that come after you that had it so easy when you had it so hard and it's a trap we can fall into. And so I, I kind of learned from that never to do that. Mm -hmm. And I, so I think, you know, in that mentoring relationship, you should be both being mentored and mentor. And it's safe. First of all, it saves you time. Like if you're being mentored, you don't have to learn all the hard lessons that that person already learned, but now their ceiling is your floor. So you're moving ahead way more quickly. If you have that teachable spirit, and when you're mentoring down, it's not just about you anymore. I mean, the gospel is so much about preferring others and putting other people first and investing in others. And so, you know, when you have that discrimination and opposition, you can make it all, it can become all about you because you have been, you know, treated so poorly and biased against, and you just want to get there. You just want to fight for your rights. But mentoring is the thing that calms all that down where now you're investing down into the, someone else and you're wanting to see them grow. You're wanting to see that them have opportunity. I think it's a good character exercise to take time to do that. And also like the benefit to them of all the hard things that you had to learn that they don't have to go through and learn the hard way like you did. I think it's, I think it's huge. No, it's good. It's really good. Well, for International Women's Day 2023 for this year, the campaign theme is, is Embrace Equity. And what they say is that we can all challenge gender stereotypes, call out discrimination, draw attention to bias, seek out inclusion. And, and this is from their website. Collective activism is what drives change from grassroots action to wide scale momentum. We can all embrace equity. And to truly embrace equity means to deeply believe and value and seek out differences as a necessary and positive element of life. To embrace equity means to understand the journey required to achieve women's equality. And so this whole thing about um, the theme drives worldwide understanding why equal opportunities aren't enough. So we talk a lot about equality, um, but this year it's about equity. And so I, I wanna hear your thoughts about that. What you believe, you know, um, when we've talked about we want women to be equal, but there this theme is all about being equitable. And then how would you say as an influential leader, do you lead with equity and encourage others to do so? So Kathy, I don't know. I mean, for your thought of the definition of, you know, equality and equity, because they're two different things, right? And, yeah, and they are. Be clear about that, because they are. Some people kind of mistake them. They're like, oh, it's the same. Equality is the same as equity, but it's actually not. Kathy, what would you say about that? What What is the difference? And then how do you lead with equity and encourage others to do so? Yeah, well, I mean, equality, you want everybody to be on the same playing field. So equalize it is what it means. 
but we're not created that way. I mean, if we're fully human created in God's image, what makes us stand out is what makes us special and particular, you know, what makes us different? What, what makes us strong? Like how we were created so intricately and uniquely. And I think we want to elevate, um, the uniqueness in each person because that's where God's image is truly seen. And so the equitable part is to allow space for that unique flavor of that, of our, you know, humanity created in God's image to come out. And that's different than making it the same for all. So I know we're not talking about equal access. I mean, that's different, but we don't want sameness. You know, we want particular uniqueness and we want space for that. If you're a leader, you're going to take the time because it takes so much more time to lead that way to develop the strengths of the one rather than, you know, the, the equality of, of all to, to pour into that, you know, to call that out, to do the work uh, in that person's life that they understand what's unique and what they bring to the table when they walk into a room, when they, when they're at a decision-making table, when they care for, uh, you know, somebody in need, they, they know exactly what they bring. And so it takes so much time away um, in their life, when you're helping them figure that out and you're coming alongside and saying, I'm calling that out in you. I want you to work on your strengths because we often work on our weaknesses, right? As women, because we want to be the same, you know, like I do the books for my husband's business, um, but I'm not an accountant. So if I kept having to work on that so I could be equal to an accountant status, that's a waste of time for me. Um, I'd rather let somebody else do that, delegate that which I'm not strong in. And so as a leader, I think to call it what's unique, I think that's the equitable way. I think that's the Jesus way, in my opinion. That's really good. Call it what's unique, Kathy, right? Which would be equitable. I think it's that picture, right? What's that picture about the fence? Everybody's sort of standing to try to look over the fence. But then, you know, equity means actually creating, you know, boxes that actually like help the person who's smaller, middle, taller to see over the fence, right? It's like actually creating that. So some people might need more, some people might need less, right? And, and it's that's equitable. That's not equality. Equality, what, what's the picture? It's like everybody would be on the same, I think, level of box or something, but there would still be like, da, 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 like a step. Whereas, you know, being equitable would actually make them equal, but by creating the the apple box a different height and that's sort of what equitable means but I think it's a great visual Char, what about for you as a leader how do you lead with equity and encourage others to do so i think recognizing that that it is a need like just even shining a light on it like we are today just being aware that it's that it, it is something that is um that is very needed and i think that um just like you said, Kathy, everybody's got a unique voice. God's created them so uniquely uh, with their voice and with their giftings. Um, for a leader, I think that being a listener, being a learner, um, you know, just like being attentive to that, it, that people do have different needs. People are walking in different spaces and that we want to just, um, yeah, kind of, embrace and bring out the best in each person. So however we do that, um, I think that God is, you know, he has created male and female. And I think that females have such unique, like we have in that sixth sense or that, you know, we have like ways and, and, and means to, to do jobs and space, be in spaces that, um, that are different from men. And, and they're, they might look different. They, we should be celebrating that, that differences and, um, and then bringing that, those strengths out. Like, I, like Kathy said too, I think that, uh, yeah, just working in our, in our fullness and, um, as you know, alongside men, um, with, a security that, and a value and a worthiness that God created us this way and we have lots to offer. So. Yeah, I think, yeah, just listening and being aware and, and um, watching for those opportunities because they can look different each time for us as leaders, yeah. Mm. 
Okay. Well, you took a little bit of what I was going to say, um, <laughs> but I think um, listening is so huge and creating safe spaces for people. You really can't leave with equity until people feel safe to tell you their actual mm -hmm. truth. And I've learned this in so many different ways over the years. I remember um, one of my friends who happens to be black telling me that the police harass black people in Toronto. And I was like, you don't suffer discrimination anywhere near what I lived in the South of the U S for four years. And, um, I saw such blatant discrimination. So I was like, I just don't believe it, you know, and this was decades ago. So please don't judge me, but you know, like I, I didn't see it because I wasn't black. And, um, along the same lines, I had somebody I, who worked for me who also was black. And I always thought, wow, they, they don't really seem to be upset about racism at all. And years later, I had lunch with them after they had left and they poured out their heart about all the pain that they had had from discrimination. And I said, why did you never mention this when you were working with me? Oh, because you were white and I didn't feel safe. And so those were two really big learning experiences for me to realize I needed to listen without my biases about what I think is truth to really hear right. what people's lived experiences. And then also really take those steps to make them know that they are safe to tell me their lived experiences, because you can, you can issue the invitation, but if they don't really feel safe and that you're really gonna listen and that you're gonna lay aside all of your opinions of your lived experience, then they're really not gonna share it with you. And you, you can't even take those first steps toward equity until those first two things happen. So I think that's what I've learned the hard way in my life. And I try to practice it now when people tell me things that I don't see or I find quite shocking. Um, I just I just shut up and I just really listen with an open heart to be educated and to learn what life looks like from their perspective. It's mm, really good. good. I'm hearing uh, calling out the, the uniqueness of each individual, of women listening, safety, there's trust. It really is that. There's a lot about that, you know, trust and safety, listening and calling out uniqueness. And these are all great. <laughs> and so in that, it's like, and if we do that, imagine our churches and ministry. <laughs> if we were committed to ensuring safe places, uh, that we were listening, that we would, you know, set aside our biases and prejudices and, and really look at the person, see the person as who God has created them to be, calling out uniqueness, spending time, presence, mentoring. Imagine what the church could look like, um, our workspaces could look like. So let's imagine that as we sort of end the conversation a little bit. But if the church did this, if our ministry did these, all these things that you incredible women are suggesting and saying that we need to do for equity, equality and equity, what would the church and our workplaces look like? what would that what would that look like and if so uh how can we get to those spaces because we know we have issues with the church people leaving the church i mean i've done shows on that about people leaving the church you know women feeling discouraged just so much uh, around the discouragement of of trust for the church then of god of faith all of that so I know it's big picture, but I just, I, it's, it's really a good conversation and, and question to answer. What would it look like if we did all this? Kathy, I know you're like, Kathy, this is your thing. <laughs> yeah. Years ago, uh, there was a book, uh, authored by Francis Schaefer called how should, how should we then live? And I've always thought like, I, I am writing another book and I keep coming to this question, like how, how do I then live? Like, how do I live in this complicated, complex world? Like the church is complicated, the world has upended itself. It's not the same as it was last year, two years ago, three years ago, or with or when any of us like put our hand up for, for this. And I think, you know, the question is, how do we co-labor together? Because it's not just like advancing the mission uh, of women in the world. It is that for sure. We're women. We want that to happen. But to me, it, it it is the church. You know, it is the bride of Christ being elevated. It is the bride of Christ leaving a sweet fragrance on the earth. That's what we're all here for. That's what I'm here for. And in Ephesians uh, 5.27, I love that uh, the NASB said that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. 
I love that. Having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. And in the NIV, we're called the Radiant Church. And I love this. I love that scripture is already said, look, this is who you are. And this is, you know, as a female church, part of the greater church, um, this is how male and females ought to live together because the passage that precedes that is talking about the marital relationship between men and female, male and female. And so even in the description of the church in all her glory, God creates space for the feminine expression of his nature and his character. And I think since God created space for that, who are we to default on that and take ourselves out of the picture? Cause we don't like what's happening. You know, we don't like, we're never going to like a lot of stuff. You know, it's never perfect, but we need to say, you know, forget my expectations. How do I create this picture of what God set out as the design? How do I become part of that? How do I bring a sweet fragrance? How do I leave any context I'm in better than, you know, when better than I found it? Like this is our opportunity, um, you know, Women were first at the cradle, last at the cross. We've been there in all the defining moments of history. You know, the Rahabs, uh, the Ruths, like the lines that created, you know, the lineage that, that Jesus came from were all women stepping into very unique moments where, you know, they shouldn't have been there, but they were there. And I think for every, every woman now, if you want to change history, if you want to change the church, you're going to stay your path. You're going to stay obedient to your call. You're not going to go off and get a job at Costco. Like you're, you're going to stay there and get what you need around you to resource you, you know, the community, the relationships, um, you know, a healthy lifestyle that helps you stay in the game because there's a future still being written. Like we haven't come to the end, but we're near the end. But what you do in this moment really matters. And it not just matters to you and women, although we are very important, it matters to the church and the church is the bride. So. so good. So good, Kathy. Thank you for that. Char, your thoughts. Yeah, no, I love that. I think that we always um, move forward with hope, with great expectation. We cannot lose hope. I think that, um, yeah, even if the, there is a battle, there's going to be a battle. We're born in a battle. I think the battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the principalities. And we have to recognize that too, that there's a constant, um, attack on the way. And even I would say, um, especially on women, it was, goes back to, to the garden. It goes back to the serpent and the, the woman. And I think that we have to just, um, recognize our, our place in, um, yeah, keep, hold our position, hold our position in who we are and hold our position in who God wants us to be in the church. And he wants us to, to work together with the whole body. And I think that that is when we're going to see um, just this beautiful expression of the church is when we, when we keep moving in that, in that space and, and just hold on to hope that it's, we're, we're, we're going to get there. Um, yeah. So I think that like, just, like you said, Kathy, it's just, uh, we're, we're being, um, these are our times of where the, the enemy's ramping up and, uh, but but the, the church of God, nothing will prevail against it, right? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I think that we just, um, yeah, we're going to keep working towards that hope. Hold on to hope. I yeah. like that a lot, Char. Awesome. I have a dream. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that would be a church that leads in these areas of equity and inclusion. Not, you know, somebody said to me the other day, we always seem like a day late, a dollar short. We're always like trailing in terms of these things. My dream would be to see a church as the first to advocate and speak up for the rights of, of everyone who feels oppressed or that the doors are closing to them. That, but that men, but we do pro men and pro women, you know, men don't have it so easy in this culture either in a lot of ways. And so for me, I, it's really important to me always, even as I'm advocating for women, to make sure I'm advocating for the men in my life because the world needs all of us to step up mm -hmm. to our calling and position. Um, 
women that would cheer on women, women that would cheer on men, men that would cheer on women, men that would cheer on men. <laughs> you know, I, I just, yeah, I think it would look so different because we wouldn't lead toward equity and inclusion from a place of offense or demanding my personal rights, but as a passion for the globe and for calling um, to fulfill our calling. You know, I, I've been thinking a lot in this, the last five years about the parable of the talents, you know, how God, that's a story of how God gave different people or the, was it the boss gave different people talents and some of them went and multiplied the talents and some of them hid their talent in the ground. And to the one that multiplied, he gave more, but the one that hid their talent, he even took that talent away. And so it's like, you know, there's the corporate of how it could look. And then there's the individual. How are we stewarding what God gave us? And out of the spirit of false humility, are we holding back from <sighs> writing that book, from preaching that sermon, from having that podcast, from stepping up into that role out of, you know, some sort of holy idea of, you know, not promoting ourselves, but, but what we're really doing is we're burying that talent out of fear. And so being faithful to the call, being faithful with everything that God's given you and just pouring it out, man, if we all did that, I just think the world would look different. I mean, the world's going to do what the world's going to do, but yeah. our impact and influence would be so much wider and so much deeper. Wow. So much here. I've been writing notes, lots of notes and Here's the thing, you know, as I think about, as we just talked about how, how will the church retain women leaders? What are we getting wrong? What are we getting right? Why are you leading our biggest wins and challenges? How, as a leader, you're embracing equity and encouraging others to do so. And if we did all of this, what would the church look like? What would the world around us look like? And I'm really encouraged. I think that as you all were sharing, you know, Calling, other to great, calling others to greatness, pro-men and pro-women, holding on to hope, feeling safe, listening, calling out the unique part of each person, presence, mentoring, next generation. I mean, all of these things you're all doing. As women today, I, I am so humbled by just being with you that you have taken the brave and hard way to do these things. And, you know, the work that God is doing in through you is, is incredible. And it's, it is really a privilege to, to sit and listen and hear what you're doing. But also, I think really convicting of me is I need to pray for you. I need to pray for each one of you more and pray for you in the work and, and do more of sending an email or texting to say, hey, just thinking of you, sharing you on. Because it's, it's not easy work. And I think one of the big things that stood out to me was, and our biggest enemy is ourselves <laughs> a lot of times. And so how do we as women encourage and, and remind one another that you're good. You can do this. If you don't know it, God will help you. Those around you ask for help. Uh, but I think that's the big thing of, of just being in each other's spaces and encouraging one another. Cheryl, I know I, I feel like you need to say something. I do. I just want to say this is a great picture of the kind of community that women need. Like I've just learned so much listening to all of you and I've been so inspired and convicted and growing, like just growing as I'm listening to you. That That's the spaces we need to have because um, you all are phenomenal. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Oh, we're going to we're going to continue the gush fest on International Women's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the next hour of this, uh, of this episode is International Women's Day and our gush fest and love for one another <laughs> and all the great things that we're doing. <laughs> I just want to encourage you. I think that what you've shared has been really encouraging to our, our viewers and listeners because I think women need to be reminded of these things. Men need to be reminded of these things. And I think we need to work together. It's going to take all of us, you know, to make changes, to to release the gifting that God has poured into each and every single person, right? Like it's gonna take all of us to do this work. And so thank you. Any last thoughts, any last takeaways or thoughts? I'll give you an, another minute to share any last thoughts of encouragement. If you, didn't, if you forgot to say something, now's your time. But any last thoughts, Shara, do you have something that you wanna say? Thank you, as well? thank you. Thank you for um, creating space for this opportunity and, you know, I, I think uh, I would love this conversation to be mainstream. That's what I, that's for me, that would be equitable. 
having this conversation in this space is amazing, but having it, you know, where all of those that are making decisions about the future of church in Canada can be at the table because we are intelligent, bright women in this, in this group. And we represent the voices of so many uh, that are even caring more than we are. So thank you for even planting this seed and creating this space, Mel. Thanks so much. I would echo that. And I think the rest of you for your comments, I, I feel encouraged too. I feel like, I don't know, I just got some more, some more um, energy and, and um, excitement about what, you know, where God's called us to lead and, and just being on the conversation with you is so insightful. So thank you, Mel. Thank you, the rest of you. I, I sometimes when I'm speaking can look over a group of women and I see unopened gifts. Mm -hmm. I can see it. I can sense it. Um, I have such a passion to see people take those risks and step out and say yes. And I know from my own experience, I was always afraid, but I just decided early on that I didn't want fear to rob me of my life and that you generally don't die if you do it afraid. <laughs> so what I would say is do it afraid, step out even when you don't feel worthy, and don't get a chip on your shoulder about the discrimination you see around you. It is a trap. You have to keep your heart pure. If you want to be in this for the long haul, um, that's, that's the only way to do it, is just to trust that God is going to get you where he needs to get you. Let him work all that good character, yucky stuff of forgiveness and kindness mm. to those who are hurting you and taking the high road. Like that's all good leadership stuff, you know, and you only get it the hard way. And so I think, yeah, weeding the garden of your heart, it's so important in that leadership space and just stepping out and taking risks, even when you feel unworthy and afraid. That's it. That's essentially the job. So good. So good. So good. Well, Kathy Ostapchuk, Shark Rearing, and Cheryl Weber, cheering you on. I uh, What a special time on this International Women's Day of 2023 to be together and to listen, to learn, to encourage one another. So thank you so, so much for being with me today and to our viewers and listeners. As you lead and influence and mentor and speak and write and parent and inspire and coach and encourage others around you and preach, <laughs> and teach and all the things that women do know this truth that you are seen you are heard and you are deeply loved by god thank you so much for joining us today